for or how you can handle the camera. What is the relationship between text and images? May I give you first a historical? Yes, especially. And then a phenomenological interpretation. I believe that writing arose from the destruction of images. You, I imagine, the, it's not that I imagine it, I can, there are tablets in the Museum of Man in London which show exactly what I mean. You have an image. The image shows a situation. But the image has become opaque to the situation because it covers up what it shows. In German you can say it better than in English. Das Bild stellt sich vor das, was es vorstellt. All right, so the image becomes a screen which hides what it means. And this creates magical consciousness. Because magic is an attitude which instead of taking images to orient oneself in the world, takes the world to orient oneself in the image. I think this is a good definition of magic. You can put your hand into the surface of the image and pick out one image element after the other and then align those elements on a so to speak on a thread now we would now call these elements pixels but before that they were called pictograms you took the elements out of the image you put them in a line and that was called pictographic writing now what did it mean that in its origin Texts explain, count, recount, criticize images, and their purpose is to destroy images. So the original relationship between text and image is this. Texts advance against images in order to explain them away. And you can see that not only in the Jewish prophets, who are so violently opposed to images and in favor of writing and you can see it all, even in the pre-socratic and even in Platon even Platon if you read him carefully you can see that he understands writing as an attack against the image so one would suppose that as texts go on the images will disappear Texts would take out the contents of images and unroll them into lines. Of course, it's an impossible undertaking because as the image is a surface and it has infinite, an infinite number of lines, you can continue to draw out lines of a surface you will never terminate because there, are inf there is an infinite number of lines. But still, the tendency would be that texts explain images to explain them away. But there is a dialectics in this. As the texts explain the images, the images turn around and they begin to illustrate the texts. They infiltrate the texts. And they, as if secondarily, they vampirize on the texts. You can see that, for instance, in medieval manuscripts with the initial letters where the where the images infiltrate the text in order to illustrate it and render it imaginable. Now, this sounds to be a very superficial description, but it is not. What I am saying here is that texts, which are the articulation of historical consciousness, aim at destroying magic, but as they do it, magic infiltrates historical Th thinking and historical thinking it becomes itself magical and you can see it for instance in the second and third century where the adoration of texts textolatry substitutes itself for idolatry and the moment the textolatry begins Images infiltrate themselves. When you see the iconoclastic movement, it is the opposite of a textoclastic movement, if I may say so. And the same is in the 19th and 20th century, because if you compare fascism and communism, what is the, the fundamental difference from a point of view of co code? 
Marxism is a textolatric vision of the world which tries to eliminate images and fascism is a idolatrous thing which wants to invent text and in the end they two meet and you cannot even distinguish them because the texts have invaded the images and the images have invented the text. Yet if you say that Hitler would not have been possible if there had been television I'm not so sure whether it is true, because Nazism would have probably been capable of devouring the texts, the images, as it devoured the, the images in radio. It is true, Nazism is a thing of the radio. Can I uh, ask you to speak about the <coughs> relationship, the differences or similarities uh, uh, of the different type of technical images? Thank you for that question. I will start from a structural point of view. If I distinguish the chemical and the electronic images, it's a question of the fineness of grain. Now, this looks rather superficial. You might say a photograph and a film, which are chemical images, are crude, definitions and an electronic image like a video image or a computer image are fine definitions. But this is very, a very far-reaching difference. May I go a little bit into philosophy again? When mathematical calculating thinking became conscious, the idea was to calculate the universe. Now, to calculate means to reduce it to small elements, calculi, to find out what the universe is built on. And if you find the stones on which the elements are built, you can then put it together and make a new universe with it. But to the surprise, I'm sorry that this is so noisy, but to the surprise of everybody, including the calculating minds, Calculating rationality is much more powerful than it than it knows. It can divide everything. It can calculate everything. There is no such thing as an atom. There is no such thing as a last ball, as a last pebble of which the world is made. An atom is can be divided into particles and the particle into particles of particles. But then a funny thing happens. You get to the point where you no longer know that what you are doing is really a particle of the world, or is it your own mind? For instance, the question whether a quark is a particle of an atom, or whether it is a symbol of calculation, is not a good, is not a good question. You finally get to a point where the whole process of calculation becomes ambiguous. You do not know whether you are calculating the world or whether you, by calculating, are projecting the world. Now the same thing goes on on the side of the, of the, of the calculating subject. You might think that if you analyze a subject, if you calculate a subject, you will come finally to something definite. Let's call it an individuum. You know, individuum is the Latin translation of atom. So that you will finally come against an individuum on the one hand, and then atom on the other, and then you have the building blocks of the world. An individual who is calculating atoms, and an, an, an atom which is constituting an individual. But as you analyze an individual, the individual gets, it bec becomes calculated, calculable. I'm sorry, it takes a little bit longer. You can analyze the individual with various methods. For instance, you can analyze him uh, psychoanalytically, or you can analyze him uh, existentially, or uh, logical analysis, or uh, neurophysiological analysis. And whatever you do, you find that there is no such thing as an individual. That the indi now what happens is a curious thing. Suppose you to take decisions. Now the decision seems to be a typical aspect of individual freedom. I am free because I can decide. Now you analyze that. You find that there is a decision tree, and on the decision tree there are various uh, parameters of virtualities, and that to decide is to 
choose one alternative and take all the other alternatives away. Now the moment you have chosen that alternative, it uh, again opens up into a whole fan of new alternatives and you must again choose one and lose all the others. And you can never know whether you have decided well, because in order to know that you would have to try all the other alternatives, which you cannot. So that you find that the decision making is not really a good thing because it's empirical. So you make a machine and you put the decision uh, tree into the machine and you put the, 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 the parameters, the decision, and all of a sudden the machine die, decides much better than men do that. You can play chess against the machine and the, the, the machine will win because the machine decides better than you do. Now this analysis of decision making into decidim, put the following question, is a decidim a subjective thing? Or is it something objective, mechanizable, which I can put into a machine? I give you another example. To act is something human, isn't it? Because to act, what does it mean to act? I am in one world that is as it is. I am in another world that is as it ought to be but is not. And now I act in order that in, that, that which is not, that what ought to be as not be, and that what that reality become as it should be. Hmm? Acting is typically human. Hmm? Now, this acting can be divided and this, 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 calculated into actomes. And you can put the actomes into a machine and the machine begins to act. Now the question is, is a robot an individual? A robot is not an individual. It acts. It doesn't act quite like a human being. It acts uh, like an object does, but it acts. And again, the same thing that happened on the side of the atom happens on the side of the individual. R rational analysis does away with the difference between subject and object. And here you have now a curious terrain, a gray zone, where the little elements into which the world has been calculated are no longer either individual, either subjective, nor objective, but something in between. They are virtualities. Now with these virtualities, which are neither objective nor subjective, you can create subjects and objects. You can project virtual worlds, virtual spaces, and with those spaces you can project virtual individuals, virtual subjects. It is a question of the fineness of calculation. Now with chemical images, now coming back to your question, chemical images, which work with molecules, like a photograph or a film, you can't do it. It's too gross. A film or a photograph is always an objective picture made by a subject. The distinction is there. It's not a very good distinction, because you never know whether the the picture which you see is really objective and whether the thing that made the picture was really a subject or whether it was not an automatic apparatus. But still, there is this vague distinction between subject, he who photographs and that which is being photographed. But with electronic images, where the elements are very fine and where the definition is very exact, this distinction has no longer any sense. And we are beginning to discover this. If you project with these images a virtual space, then you exist virtually within the space. I don't want to give you examples of those gloves when you go into the, and you understand it. But again, I go back to the war, the go for. I saw a picture in television, which was to me a revelation. There was a helicopter, maybe you saw it. And the helicopter just bombed the Iraqi lines. And it came back and landed. And there were, there were journalists waiting for it. And the helicopter opened and out came the pilot. But the pilot had forgotten to take his virtual helmet out of his head. So as he stood at the day, all the guns of the, of the, of the, of the helicopter aimed at those press people. And in the last moment he took the helmet off so that he was both in the virtual space and in the real space and he existed in both and you cannot call him anymore a subject. He was himself an image. 
No, I'm not very tired. How long? How long is it going on? Because we are going to talk tonight again. It's impossible. No, they want one hour, maybe. How long have I, have I been speaking? Let me talk for another 20 minutes. I, I would like to do this. This was a dramatic point, which I just said. In the electronic image making, no longer has it any sense to say whether the image is objective or not, but it is also in no sense to say whether he who makes it is a subject or not, because he is within the image. At this point, the question is how the determinism and free will, as the old philosoph like an old philosophical problem, came to this uh, uh, circle. How uh, can we speak about again from another point of view? We are going to have a round table. Ivan Illich, uh, Baudrillard, Kittler. Uh, Moravec than myself, and the, pr uh, and the question is exactly the question which you ask. So I am a little bit prepared to that question. I will give you my answer. As long as you think historically, as long as you think in terms of cause and effect, there can be no freedom. Because if everything is the effect of a cause and will cause an effect, there is no room. Now, of course, we have traditionally two race out. One, you say, we are overdetermined. I lift my arm because of uh, physical reasons and um, physiological reasons and psychological reasons and cultural reasons. I, there are many reasons and there are so many that I don't, cannot know them and therefore I am convinced that I lift the arm because I want to. So out of ignorance I am free and the other is out of knowledge, endless idea that the, no, the knowledge of necessity is freedom, but both ideas are very bad. Let's face it, if you have a historical, political consciousness, freedom is impossible. But now, if you are outside this idea, if you now think in formal, analytical terms, the problem is no longer cause and effect, but accident and necessity. You are in a context where accident becomes necessary statistically, so to speak. That if you throw a dice long enough, you will be sure that every six throw will be a one. And this is a certitude born out of accident. Now here, freedom becomes, becomes a meaningful term. Because freedom is then to turn accident around and make something improbable, necessary. The famous example, everything that we do would come without us by chance. A million chimpanzees which write a million years on a million typewriters will of necessity write by chance the divine comedy. Now what did Dante do? He turned the accident around and he made something which was very improbable, necessary. And this is freedom. And this new idea of freedom as turning around of chance, of accident, this is in the technical images. But that would lead too far. I'm writing a book, and this may be the second part, which I call Menschwerdung, humanization and which goes from the following hypotheses. As far as I know, we are the only animals who build themselves, who create themselves. We are the only animals who turn nature around and transform it into culture. Now you can say that in various forms, you can say that we are the only animals who can transmit acquired information against the Mendelian laws and so on. But one way to put it is that we play with accident against accident. We use accident to go accident accident. But in the end, of course, this must fail. Because in the end, an accident turned around is still an accident. And it must go back into this uh, long uh, linear tendency toward entropy. So my book will try to show that the 
effort to become humans is in the end doomed to failure and that you began to begin to see that to become human is something strictly impossible. Is that an answer to your question? Of course, it, this is a very desperate thing. It was born of my experience with political experience with Nazism and Stalinism and with my philosophical experience with positivistic analysis and structural analysis. But still, I believe that it is in some sort a religious book. Because if you say that man is an animal that builds himself and that he is doomed to failure, you somehow step out of the whole experiment into transcendence. It's a curious sort of irreligious religiosity, but it's still religious. I think that would be a good 